Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a very warm welcome to this uh, Current Legal Problems lecture. My name is Professor Paul Mitchell. I'm one of the editors of the Current Legal Problems series. And in addition to, welcome you, to welcoming you to our virtual UCL um, this evening, it's my role to introduce our chair for this lecture. Now, ordinarily, when I introduce a chair for these events, um, and I don't know if you hear the fireworks, it is fireworks, I can show you. Um, when I introduce a chair for these events, um, I often talk about the importance of connections between the practicing legal profession and academia. I'm very pleased that this evening our, our, our chair, um, Robert Carnworth, embodies the kind of connection between academia and the legal profession, which we hope that these lectures will foster. Um, because as I'm sure many of you will know, um, Lord Carnworth was until March of this year, uh, a justice of the Supreme Court. He's now an honorary professor at UCL, where we're delighted to have welcomed him. Prior to that, he was um, noted for his interest in law reform and particularly as chairman of the Law Commission from 1998 to 2002, um, has been responsible for many pioneering law reform projects. So uh, Lord Carnworth, we're really delighted that you could be here this evening to, to chair the lecture. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I'll now hand over to you to introduce, if I may, our speaker. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to represent the interface between the judiciary and the academic world, if that's what I'm doing. Anyway, I'm, I'm very honored to be part of the UCL team now. Um, and I'm very honored to be asked to chair this lecture. We have a very distinguished speaker who's, I think, the other side of the world in Portland, Oregon, <laughs> where it's rather earlier than it is here, but there she is. And, um, and we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Lisa Benjamin. She has a sort of UCL background, because I think you, you did your MA here, didn't you? And, but um, she's... Uh, now she's assistant professor at Lewis and Clark Law School in Portland, Oregon. Um, and she has a very distinguished academic background and has been in many uh, has degrees from different parts of the world and has also taught in different parts of the world and various publications. I'm not gonna go through all those because when we're here, we want to hear her speaking as she is now. But I think more importantly, she's I understand her doctoral studies focused on carbon major companies, corporate and energy law and climate change. And there's going to be a forthcoming monograph with Cambridge University Press called Companies and Climate Change Theory and Law in the United Kingdom to be published next May. And so um, I think her lecture tonight may be drawing some of the themes of that book. So. Uh, Lisa, we look for, forward to your, your talk. Over to you. Thank you very much, Lord Conworth. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you uh, by Zoom, and thank you very much for chairing this lecture. I'd also like to thank Professor Mitchell and the team at UCL, who's really done a remarkable job in putting this together. I'm so sorry that I can't be with you uh, in person uh, today, particularly to see the students at UCL. I'm worried to my LLB degree. Um, this is obviously a much more climate friendly way to have a lecture, but it's certainly not as uh, fun to see everyone in uh, person. So um, I'm gonna start with uh, some slides um, and I'm gonna speak for about 40 minutes, um, 40 to 45 minutes. Um, and I really wanna to speak to you today about uh, the relationship between uh, company law. So I look quite a bit at company law, particularly uh, Today, I wanna to look at group companies. I wanna look at the relationship between group companies and a series of cases that started really in 2012 and the implications of those cases for climate change and in particular for climate equity in the global South. So it's been a really rocky couple of days in the United States where I am at the moment. Um, it's been a very uncertain and difficult time. I also want to acknowledge that we're in this sort of moment of tremendous loss this year. Not only are we in this sort of political turmoil, 
moment. We're in a public health crisis. There's been a tremendous amount of loss. Um, we're also facing a climate crisis, an economic crisis, and of course, a crisis in terms of racial justice. And there's been a huge amount of loss um, in this country and both internationally in the uh, legal academy and in the civil rights movement. And this relates to what I wanna to talk to you about today, particularly this quote by John Lewis, um, never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. And so to borrow a little bit from his philosophy, I'm here to make a little bit of good trouble in terms of corporate law with you today. So there's really four sections to my talk. The first uh, section I'm going to focus on transnational companies and the history of these companies, particularly in relation to the extractive industries in the global south and connect that history to climate change. The second section I wanna talk about sort of core corporate doctrines of separate legal personality and limited liability and why they don't really work, particularly for tort victims. And those tort victims are the claimants in the third set of my talk where I'm gonna look at a series of cases starting in 2012, um, where there's been a sort of evolution of a duty for parent companies. And finally, I wanna end briefly in relation to a case for reform. So why am I talking about companies in, in the context of climate justice? So for a long time, company law and companies felt fairly insulated from the impacts of environmental harms, um, from social movements, and particularly for movements around climate change. And the reason why company law and companies themselves felt this way is because the traditional doctrinal approach was that their major role was to maximize the wealth of shareholders. But this is not entirely the case, and it's not always been the case. And so companies have always been sensitive to, to a certain extent, um, and dependent upon what's called the social license to operate. And so they are... Um, aware of, and in some cases sensitive to these movements around climate change, climate justice, racial justice. And so it is sort of this sensitivity um, that can be really picked up upon and uh, provide a bridge in terms of company law for corporate actions in the context of climate change. So when I'm talking about the Global South today, um, I sort of go a little bit back and forth between what used to be called developing countries, those are countries that are now referred to as the Global South. And so you can see them in this picture in green. Uh, it's not entirely geographically correct. So you can see the countries in red are the Global North. And those include some countries like Australia and New Zealand that are in the Southern Hemisphere. So the reason we refer to them as Global South countries is because the term developing has sort of uh, clear normative um, implications. And there's been a really long history of operations of transnational companies as the UN refers to them or multinational companies that have um, jurisdictional presences in different countries. And in fact, it's very clear that these kinds of companies like on the left, the British East India Company, which operated in uh, South and East Asia and was really sort of uh, the extension of the state and um, really had you know, significant numbers of, ar of armed forces, uh, was used as a corporate vehicle to establish economic and political dominance, um, in, including using you know, racial norms in making a lot of profits. Um, in the middle, we have a picture of the Anglo-American Corporation, uh, which still operates today as a group, has a very long history on the African continent. And on the right, we have an image of the Hudson Bay Company. Um, so these corporate entities have a very long um, history and a fairly exploitative history in terms of economic exploitation and racial exploitation. And so I just wanna make the point that companies have been involved in and facilitated the colonial project for some time. And I use in the paper that I'm preparing for the journal, uh, this concept of corporate imperialism, which was developed by Caribbean scholar, Norman Gervin. And his book, Corporate Imperialism, Conflict and Expropriation, really charts the rise of the use of the corporate form to gain power and control, not only over governments, but also actually over workers and labor forces. And he identifies the use of particularly transnational corporations as the institutionalization of this power. And so the legitimization of this power through a legal form and through the use of company law, in particular, the establishment of subsidiaries. And he actually identifies that this was done very um, well in terms of the bauxite industry in the Caribbean, the oil and gas industry, um, which I refer to as carbon majors, and the minerals industry. So extractive industries have for a very long time used the corporate form this way. And this is a very infamous image of the Standard Oil um, uh, conglomerate. And this 
idea of Standard Oil, uh, Peter Michlinski, who writes quite a bit about multinational companies, has actually documented that Standard Oil, the cartel Standard Oil, which was broken up in the early 1900s, actually used corporations, the corporate form, multinational corporations, very effectively to establish uh, control around the world. And so it really highlights the fact that these companies have used the corporate form to establish a tremendous amount of profits um, and economic, but also political power. And so um, this continued, it's not new, uh, we've been aware of this kind of corporate power and sort of exploitation of uh, workers, uh, violations of human rights all through the 1990s. So you may remember sort of the Nike and the sweatshop labor issue. This is a picture of Ken Sarawiwa in Nigeria, a writer who was uh, killed by the government in Nigeria. And, you know, Shell has been operated in Nigeria for a long time and was sort of implicated in this incident. And there's a tremendous mismatch between the power and the reach of these multinational companies and the jurisdictional or national um, legal systems that are attempting to monitor their reach. And this idea of um, transnational governance has not really been able to match uh, the power of these companies and uh, the economic and political power that they have gained over the years. And that's because these companies are really complex entities jurisdictionally for international law to regulate. Um, international law regulates states, they're not states. And so it's really up to national legal systems to try to attempt to govern these companies. And that has actually been um, very difficult to do. And it's not just that these companies have tremendous um, economic power, they've gained a lot of political power and they've actually been involved in shaping the rules around regulation and in particular, influencing international regulatory rules to ensure that they don't have liability um, in terms of uh, international scope, the international reach of their business operations. So there's really no international binding obligations in, in relation to environmental law, which governs these companies. There are very few obligations. So the United Nations Guiding Principles on Businesses and Human Rights establishes responsibilities on companies. There are some other mechanisms um, where you know, individuals can submit complaints um, around the operations of companies. But particularly in the context of climate change and environmental harms, these companies have treated greenhouse gas emissions as negative externalities. They're treated as costs which are pushed outside of the business and outside of the group. And they're only internalized um, by companies on a voluntary basis. And so we really don't have strong international legal governance mechanisms. And in this context, I'm talking specifically about traditional equity-based corporate groups. And that's where you will have a parent company, which is often uh, registered in the global North country. And then you will have subsidiary uh, companies underneath that. So subsidiary one and two would be direct subsidiaries and three, four, and five would be indirect subsidiaries. And those subsidiaries, particularly in extractive industries are located in the global South. And so what happens is that the profits from this group activity is really sent up usually upwards to the parent company through the issuance of dividends. And so the parent company and the group as a whole is profiting from this group activity. But in terms of corporate law principles, liability is really pushed down or sequestered, as um, Dearborn said, sequestered in terms of a subsidiary company. And the sort of benefits of that hazardous activity financially benefit the group, but the harms of those um, actions are sort of stuck within a particular subsidiary and in a particular uh, company. And so that's sort of a traditional approach of a group company. And this creates a number of problems, what I call multiple equity binds, when we look at the operation of these companies in the context of the global south. So if we focus on carbon majors or oil and gas uh, companies, they have very long and often exploitative histories in global south countries. And because these uh, corporate groups have been around for such a long time, they have long histories in the industry. And so they, um, they have historically emitted a huge amount of greenhouse gases. And the communities that are often next to or near um, the activities of these companies are often already climate vulnerable communities for a number of reasons. So we know that climate change will have disproportionate impacts in the global south. These communities where these extractive industries are uh, cited and often employed in the industry 
are often impoverished or subsistence communities. They rely on the environment for subsistence living. And because of that sort of level of socioeconomic development, they really don't have a lot of resilience to climate change in the first place. And so what we see is this sort of vicious cycle where um, communities are already bearing the historic economic and racial burden of colonialism. They're often impoverished communities. They have these sort of socioeconomic legacies and they're climate vulnerable. And then sort of the implications directly of environmental pollution from these groups and indirectly from the emission of greenhouse gases has disproportionate impacts on these communities. So it's not that companies are not concerned about the environment. Um, in fact, they are concerned about it and their group policies tell us that they're concerned about it. So you will often see corporate social responsibility reports by carbon majors. This is an example of Shell's CSR report. And in these statements, they will often have uh, fairly vague um, statements about environmental responsibility. These policies are established and written at the parent group company. And they, the reason they have them is to try and standardize operations among the group. And so if you see, particularly under the title here, this is a combination of a sustainability and environmental report, and they'll combine them with their health and safety reports. And so these will often be in one uh, parent uh, company group policy. And they really strive to, strive to achieve a certain amount of standardization among the group with these policies. So this brings me on to the second section of uh, my talk, where I really want to investigate sort of core corporate principles of separate legal personality and limited liability. So these are often considered together, although they develop separately historically in the law. And so when a company incorporates, the veil of incorporation comes down and the company itself is separate and apart from the legal entities of their shareholders. And there's been a lot of critiques about corporate personhood from sort of moral and normative um, implications. And um, this is just an example from the Hobby Lobby case in the US. But in fact, these kinds of um, principles of corporate law have been around for a very long time. And so in the UK, the Joint Stock Companies Act in 1844 made it much easier to establish a company. There is no need for a royal charter. But in fact, that uh, concept of a separate legal person uh, started with unlimited liability of shareholders. It was only some 10 years later through the Limited Liability Act that limited liability for shareholders was established. And in fact, there was some opposition to this at the time. And limited liability is a good thing uh, in many instances. So it means that shareholders know that they don't have to monitor what the directors and managers of a company are doing. Uh, that means that their shares become very fungible. They're easy to sell. They don't have to sort of save a pot of money to pay for any unanticipated debts that the company itself may incur. That means that they can use that money to invest in different enterprises so they can diversify their investments. Debts are not going to be carried with the share. And so that means that markets can price shares very easily. And that means that there's a lot more liquidity in capital markets. And so this leads to more jobs, leads to more income, more tax revenue, and so economic prosperity. And companies themselves are very happy with this as well because they can uh, partition up their assets within a group of companies. And so they can keep some assets in the parent company, for example, and keep fewer assets in another part of the corporate group. And it also shields the parent company or any other company within the group from judgments or liability. But there are some problems with this, uh, particularly in relation to tort creditors, which is the subject of many of the cases that I'm going to look at. So the benefits of limited liability are really only applicable when shareholders are individuals. So they can use um, you know, additional shareholdings to diversify investments. But limited liability doesn't get rid of risk. It just shifts business risk to creditors. And this is okay when creditors are voluntary creditors. So you know, the traditional voluntary creditor is an entity who contracts with the company. They know in advance that they're gonna deal with that company and they know that it's a separate legal entity. And so they, should, they can't go after the shareholders for liability. And so what they do is they can cater for that business risk effectively. They can get insurance. They can ask for security if they're a bank and they're lending credit. They can raise the price of the costs of goods and services that they're gonna deal with or they can choose not to deal with the company at all. But this doesn't apply in relation to our tort creditors that are often referred to as involuntary creditors. They don't know that they're going to experience a tort and so they can't protect themselves in advance. And so they don't have these sort of um, mechanisms to minimize risk for themselves. And this is sort of a, a double inequity, particularly where those tort creditors are in developing countries because 
companies can use a group structure, for example, to undercapitalize a subsidiary that ba that's based in the global south country. And so if you have tort creditors that can only claim against a subsidiary, that subsidiary runs out of money, then they, they have no claim. Um, they are not able to be satisfied in terms of a remedy. And there are additional access to justice issues, particularly for communities in the global south. So there's for a long time, a number of corporate theorists have really determined that limited liability is just not appropriate in all circumstances. And in fact, you know, even uh, courts themselves have not been comfortable with this idea of unconditional limited liability. It's not economically efficient because it's really companies themselves that know the risks of the activities that they're engaging in and can cater for them. And it can also lead to moral hazard. And so if a parent company knows that it's not liable for the um, harm that's caused by the sub its subsidiary, for example, operating in the global south, there's less incentive for that parent company to monitor and really to take care that torts don't occur. And this is particularly the, the um, circumstance with the number of cases that we're looking at in terms of environmental harm and also applicable to climate change. Now, it's not that we've had unlimited liability forever. In fact, really since limited liability was established, we've had courts piercing the corporate veil in a number of jurisdictions. Uh, it happens more in the US than it does in the UK. So it's sort of fallen out of favor a little bit in the UK. And the reason why there were sort of problems with this is that there were no sort of really solid normative underpinnings. And the cases, particularly in the UK, where the corporate veil could be pierced have become much um, narrower over time. And there's also the critique that piercing the corporate veil um, is really unclear when it's going to apply because we haven't had these clear categories um, and they shift and change over time. And for companies themselves, they don't really know when they're going to be subject to a case which will pierce the corporate veil. And so um, what has happened is there have been different duties that have been developed. So we're specifically, I'm specifically concerned about uh, this relationship of group companies operating in the global south because we're facing these dual crises of climate change and biodiversity loss. And these are the two big reports that came out um, last year in relation to both of these global issues. And in particular, if we look just at uh, climate change, so if you look at the thermometer on the right, we're looking at about a one degree Celsius increase today. And if we don't take um, action urgently, we're looking at a three degree, perhaps an over three degree rise by the end of the 20th century. And the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uses this chart that's called the burning embers chart. And so you can see at the bottom, they look at different biological systems and the color coding is, you know, yellow is moderate, red is high and purple is very high. And as the temperature increases on the right, you can see I put the little gray chart where we might be by the end of the century. And you can see that we're really in sort of crisis point in a number of these um, systems. And the IPCC has actually said that continuing to emit greenhouse gases will lead to um, severe, pervasive, and irreversible impacts for people and ecosystems. And so we are really um, heading for a crisis in terms of climate change. The IPCC has also told us that the impacts of climate change will hit disproportionately on communities in the global south. And in fact, existing vulnerable communities are most at risk from the impacts of climate change. At the same time, um, the UN's report has said that we are facing significant biodiversity loss, mainly because of human activity. And so a significant percentage of land surfaces and ocean areas have been impacted, and we've lost a significant number of wetlands. And this is particularly important for uh, communities in the global south who may, for example, rely on these um, environmental ecosystems for subsistence. And so at the end of last year, uh, the UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez said, the point of no return is no longer over the horizon. It is in sight and hurtling towards us. So it's all hands on deck in terms of addressing the impacts of climate change. And so that shifts me into the third uh, section of my talk where I really wanna talk about what is the role of company law in managing these crises. And there's been a string of recent cases which have established a duty of parent companies uh, for the acts or emissions of their subsidiaries. These were primarily in relation to the harm carried out by a subsidiary company uh, which affected their employees but actually the cases have extended them to third parties that either live um, on the uh, uh, property of the subsidiary company or neighbor the subsidiary company. 
this is a short uh, timeline of the cases that have occurred. So the Chandler and Cape Industries is the first case in 2012 that established uh, the four Chandler factories. This was actually in relation to a subsidiary that was based in the UK. But we can see that there's been a couple of really busy years after that. So in 2016, there was the Vendanta case in the high court, which extended the Chandler factories, sorry, the Chandler factors beyond just affecting employees of the subsidiary. It in fact um, affected third parties that neighbored the uh, subsidiary's land. And then 2017 was a very busy year where there was another case which involved the Global South, involving Shell in Nigeria, Unilever um, in Kenya, and then the Court of Appeal decision in the Vendanta case. And these cases went back and forth as I'll illustrate. And then they were appealed. So we had two Court of Appeal decisions in 2018 in relation to the Shell and the Unilever decision. And then last year we had the um, decision of the Supreme Court saying they would accept uh, jurisdiction to hear uh, the Vendanta case, which was never actually substantively heard. And this last Supreme Court case is really important um, for claimants in the Global South. It actually made some comments specifically in relation to group policies on some of the decisions or statements that were made in the Court of Appeal decision in Unilever. So the first case is Chandler versus Cape, and this was actually in the UK. Mr. Chandler was an employee of the subsidiary, which is uh, Cape Products, and they actually made bricks. And so he was involved in making bricks, but the parent company, uh, Cape PLC, actually made asbestos board and rented space in the factory of the subsidiary in Uxbridge. And so the asbestos board was being made in the factory. And if you can see from the picture, there were no walls in the factory. And so you had this dust going everywhere. The parent was very aware of these uh, working conditions and Mr. Chandler um, sued the parent company because he contracted a lung disease as a result of the exposure to asbestos. And the subsidiary company had been dissolved and it had no um, insurance for its employees. So these uh, four Chandler factors were established. And the first one, um, this is at the Court of Appeal level by Lord Justice Arden, was that we can apply a duty to a parent company if the business of the parent and the subsidiary are basically the same, if the parent has or ought to have had superior knowledge about the um, relevant industry, and the parent knew the subsidiary's operations were unsafe, and finally, the parent knew that the subsidiary or the employees of the subsidiary would rely on that superior knowledge to protect the subsidiary or their um, employees. And that was a really important holding. And it was really tested for the first time in the Vendanta case. So Vendanta is a, a parent company based in the UK. It has a subsidiary, the Concola Copper Mines or KCM, which is based in Zambia. And the subsidiary KCM mined copper in Zambia and uh, 1,800 farmers in Zambia who are subsistence farmers sued the parent company in the UK because of water pollution. And that water pollution meant they could no longer farm, they had no access to clean water. Copper mining is a really dirty industry. And the high court in the UK extended the Chandler factor to these um, neighboring uh, third parties uh, for the farmers. The Court of Appeal affirmed that and said, actually made some interesting statements that it seems to me the Court of Appeal said, because of the group policies of Vendanta, and we'll uh, talk about that in the next slide, but because of the group policies and how they were operated by the parent company, or because of the actions of the company in exerting a type of control, that's why the Chandler factors could be extended to these employees and third parties. And in fact, Vendanta had this um, code of conduct called embedding sustainability. And in that group parent policy, Vendanta said, look, we are all um, basically responsible as a group and we as a parent company are responsible for the actions of, those, of our subsidiaries. And because of that statement, and also because there was a witness statement by an employee of the subsidiary that basically said, you know, the group policy of Vendanta said that they needed to invest in the infrastructure of the subsidiary. They knew there was water pollution going on in Zambia, but actually when Vendanta took over and they actually um, took over from Anglo-American that used to operate this mine um, previously, they basically just cut costs. They cut costs and they knew that this would have implications for pollution um, around the mine. There were also significant issues about access to justice in Zambia. Um, there had been some sort of dishonesty by the lawyers of the subsidiary company who said, we're going to fight this tooth and nail. And so the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court agreed that um, 
the farmers could use the group policies and also the exertion of control to establish a duty um, by the parent company. And the Supreme Court made comments, this was a 2019 decision on the previous um, cases and basically said, you know, we're not gonna prescribe what kind of corporate models this duty will apply to. We're gonna leave it open and we're not going to, you know, accept the statements by let's say the Unilever key case last year that said, you know, group policies can never establish liability. So the Supreme Court left it quite open, but there's been no substantive decision. Um, the Zambian government has, you know, entered into sort of a, a um, dispute with uh, KCM and the Vendanta group in relation to um, operation of the mine uh, in, in Zambia. So we may not actually get a substantial decision. But the Shell case uh, came shortly after the High Court case in the Vendanta decision. And Shell has a really long and contentious history of operating in Nigeria. There's been a significant amount of pollution. This was brought by the Ogale community um, for significant water and soil pollution because of basically mismanagement by the subsidiary company in Nigeria. And in this case, the high court said, we're not going to extend the Chandler factors. Um, and they were really persuaded because the subsidiary company, which is the Shell Petroleum Development Company or SPDC, had to have the operating license in Nigeria. And so they were responsible. Um, they had the license, they did the operations. And the parent company, World at Shell, uh, the high court found was really just a, a, a holding company didn't hold an operational license, didn't do any extraction, um, and you know, didn't provide any services, so basically didn't do anything. And there's a couple of cases that before that said holding companies are not gonna be extended to this uh, kind of parent duty. But one of the comments that I found curious in the high court decision was that they found that um, the parent company would only have superficial knowledge of the subsidiary's actions and the policies themselves, because Shell did have these mandatory policies, um, were not enough to establish liability. And I find it kind of curious that um, that holding, and in fact, there was a dissent at the Court of Appeal level specifically on that note. So the Court of Appeal affirmed the High Court decision, but there was a dissent by Lord Justice Sales that said, well, if you look at the policies, they pretty much um, uh, are pretty clear that, you know, this is a group policy. There was a clear understanding that the subsidiary company was mismanaging this oil pipeline knew about the risks and putting these two together because the parent company was facing this kind of reputational issue. So the social factors apply and the financial risk because of what the subsidiary was doing for Lord Justice Salis demonstrated a practical assumption of control. And so that was his dissenting opinion. Sir Voss gives a concurring opinion but gives some really interesting statements about group policies. And so in his view, although the group policies in this particular case did not indicate control, they could in some circumstances. And he gives this hypothetical approach that where the group policies you know, uh, advocate for harmful products and there's no kind of um, monitoring of a subsidiary company, that in those cases, the group policies could actually have some sway. So that brings me to the final uh, case in the series of the Unilever, Unilever case in Kenya. And this was a case of um, workers who both worked on the tea plantation uh, by the subsidiary company based in Kenya. And after the election in 2007, there was some significant violence and the workers who both lived and worked on a tea plantation, some of them were murdered, some of them were raped, they were assaulted. And the tea plantation workers actually brought a suit against the parent company Unilever based in the UK. And they sued the parent company uh, for damages for basically the failure of the parent company to protect them. And the court of appeal, um, did not extend the Chandler factors to this particular instance. And that's even though the Unilever had this policy called the One Unilever Operating Framework. And uh, the Court of Appeal said that this policy was not sufficient to establish a nexus of control. And that's even though the policy itself said that in a crisis, in a crisis management situation, it's gonna be our London office that's gonna really run the show. The managing director of the subsidiary company made some statements which were very persuasive to the Court of Appeal where he said, look, you know, the, the parent company doesn't deal with tea plantations. They, you know, are a product company now. I would never ask them for expertise. And so that convinced the Court of Appeal that Unilever actually had no expertise um, in the subsidiary's business. But you can see that, um, for example, Unilever is now facing boycotts from the Black Lives Matter movement, particularly around payment from workers. And in fact, I think the tea plantation workers are submitting a claim under the United Nations Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights. 
So, you know, the issue continues and goes on. So reform efforts. Uh, it's clear from this line of cases that it's not really clear what level of control the parent has to exert for this duty to be established. And it's also not clear whether group policies on their own would be sufficient to actually establish this nexus of control between the parent and the subsidiary company. So while group policies can be persuasive, uh, it's not clear if by themselves they would establish this duty. And so while it's been very interesting for the courts to create fairly innovative duties for parent companies, they certainly are a, not a comprehensive solution. And I'm very interested in this from the perspective of climate litigation. So we've seen an explosion of climate litigation, particularly against what's called carbon major companies in recent years. And this is a picture of Richard Heady, who's really uh, published this groundbreaking paper where he looked at 90, what he called carbon major companies. And he looked at their historic production records over um, about 70 years. And he identified the really the biggest 90. And you can see from this chart here, there's sort of a mix between investor owned private companies and state owned companies. And a number of those state owned companies are actually based in the global south. And what he found was that cumulatively over time, these 90 companies were responsible for 63% of worldwide global greenhouse gas emissions. And so he concludes that actually it's non-state actors, it's companies themselves that are responsible for a majority of global emissions. And this has been built upon, and I just wanna highlight here, you can see at the right, RWE is a German company that he identifies. And Richard Heady identifies them as responsible for 0.47% of historic global emissions. So Heady's work has been built upon by other academics in relation to specifically attribution science. And these, this paper um, established that, again, the same 90 companies are responsible uh, specifically for um, almost 5% temperature increases over time. And so this paper looked at these 90 carbon majors um, over again, the same period of time, sorry, they're responsible for 0.4% um, Celsius for global temperature rise. And if you remember, we're at about one degree. And so at the time, I think it ended in 2010, this paper, they were responsible for almost half of global temperature increases. And they also made the calculation for sea level rise. And if you can see in the chart here, they are able to disaggregate that by individual company. And so attribution science is getting better at trying to establish liability, but we're not quite there yet. And so what has happened in climate litigation, there's been a real mix of cases and outcomes. We don't have a number of substantive outcomes yet, but this was a case that was brought um, in Germany against RWE. So the same company that Richard Heady identified, and it was brought by Mr. Luia, who's a mountain guide in Peru. And so he uh, sued on the basis of this lake. You can see there's a glacial lake, which is melting because of climate change. And his village sits below that lake and is at risk of inundation. And so he has sued RWE in Germany. So it's a civil case, civil law case, but he has asked for 0.47% of the cost of adaptation. So a clear reliance on Heidi's paper in terms of the responsibility of companies. So it's still a preliminary stages, but they've been allowed to go to the evidentiary stage. And basically the courts said, we'll let you go to the evidentiary stage because we don't really see a problem in terms of causality for this company. And so that's really a historic uh, decision in principle, but we don't have a substantive outcome yet. In terms of the US, there's been a slew of cases um, from cities and municipalities around the United States suing oil companies specifically for damages from climate change. Um, there's two waves of this. We're now in the second wave. There's been a lot of preliminary um, decisions and there's been a lot of wrangling around jurisdiction. And so the issue is really around federal displacement. And so where you have um, federal common law in the United States, it's really been preempted by federal statutes like the Clean Air Act. And so those, those outcomes have been um, unsuccessful. And where claimants are now trying to sue under state common law, um, we have a case, the Baltimore case is now going to the Supreme Court to see whether or not they can stay in a state court and use state common law to establish a claim. They're trying to use state common law because it's not preempted by um, federal statutes like the Clean Air Act. Um, but one of the cases, uh, I think it was the Oakland case, they actually looked at torts and they said, you know, the second restatement of torts, we're going to apply that here. And in the US, that requires a balancing between a private harm and public utility of the conduct. And in this instance, for oil and gas companies, the judge found that the public utility of fossil fuels outweighed the harm. 
So it's really unclear whether or not these cases will be successful at all. Uh, a number of academics have said, look, you know, tort law is just unsuited for climate change entirely. The impacts of climate change are really diffuse. It's hard to establish causation because we cannot establish um, specific emissions from a specific company caused a specific climate impact. So we can't really make that link. But as I mentioned, attribution studies are getting better and better. And so I'm really interested to see if these hurdles were overcome, would the parent be insulated from liability? And, you know, they're getting more creative. Um, they're trying to use state claims. So we're just gonna see more and more of these um, actions against carbon major companies in particular. For example, we've seen industry now suing. So crab fishermen in California and Oregon are suing carbon majors because of algae blooms. And so they're unable to catch, um, to uh, net the number of crabs that they used to. Um, and you know, we've seen lots of cases of so shells in court in uh, The Hague as well. So there's, regardless of um, what happens in these climate litigation uh, cases, my argument really is that we need some reform. So while the post Chandler cases are, some of them are helpful, you know, some of them are successful and some of them are not. And it really depends on the type of control that's exercised by the parent company. And sometimes, you know, this is really um, depends on the corporate model that you're looking at. And so the question I really ask is, shouldn't a parent company be liable just because they are in a group? because they're actually benefiting from, you know, the activities within the group that can cause harm, but could be economically beneficial for the group company. And that really is my sort of argument for reform. And companies are now recognizing, so there's a real difference between different carbon major companies and how they're reacting to the climate crisis. So for example, Exxon in the United States is pretty much doubling down on fossil fuels, although we'll see what the outcome of the election is in terms of climate legislation. But we've seen that BP and then Shell have announced what they call net zero ambitions. And so they're trying to um, say that they are going to become net zero um, emissions companies by 2050 or sooner. The ambitions look remarkably the same. Ambitions are not targets. And so, you know, the environmental credibility of those statements is unclear. Um, but, you know, companies are making these statements. So my argument is, well, let's help them get there. Let's help them get there through company law. And we can do that through reforming the way that companies deal with climate change. There are a number of options. And so a number of academics have talked about the ways that we can reform company law, in particular in relation to group companies. So we could amend limited liability or remove it in certain circumstances. And that would basically be like piercing the corporate veil, but that is unclear and uncertain. Um, there are other options that we could use, but I think a better option is really to establish through statute enterprise liability. And this would mean that all companies in a group have liability for any actions of each other, which means you could do horizontal piercing or vertical piercing. And the benefit of that is that companies would know in advance that they are responsible for the harm caused by the subsidiaries. And the reason that I argue for that as opposed to a sort of um, case by case approach to it is that as a result of these cases, companies may just amend their group policies. They may just say, look, we're all independent, separate legal entities. We're not responsible for each other. You can comply with this environmental standard if you want, but if you don't, then that's fine. And also I think another um, uh, argument um, that uh, uh, Martin Petron makes is that this could actually be bad policy. And so we could actually be incentivizing companies to take less responsibility and less oversight for their subsidiaries if they know that in certain cases they will be responsible for the actions of those subsidiaries and they're not really clear when that's going to happen. So uh, Professor Janet Dean has talked about um, in Albania having um, what's called a control group based on you know shareholding and the exercise of control and that's in statute. Um, professors Chowdhury and Petrin have talked about enterprise liability and why that is, is a cleaner approach. Um, I think there really has to be reform in this area. The courts are clearly uncomfortable with unlimited liability, unlimited limited liability. And so a much more certain approach would be a legislative reform. And why is this important for climate change? Well, it's important because it could be applicable in some of these climate litigation, litigation cases that I've talked about. And so if we have, you know, if you can overcome causation hurdles, then parent companies could be liable for climate harms experienced in the global south. That could incentivize them to take these um, sort of net zero ambition, um, ambitions that they're establishing quite seriously um, and think about business transitions um, in a much more serious manner. 
And the second sort of broader point is irrespective of what happens with these climate litigation cases, environmental and social justice is climate justice. These communities need um, wealth, they need access to healthy um, ecosystems in order to become resilient societies for climate change. So this is the last uh, graph I'm gonna have from the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They had this report in 2019, which looked at um, what they called shared socioeconomic pathways or SSPs. SSP1 is what they call the green road. And this is where we uh, really transition to a much more equal societies, uh, lower GHG emissions and better use of land. SSP3 is where we don't do any of that. So we don't take the green road and we pretty much continue as business as usual. And so you can see that in these areas like desertification, land degradation and food insecurity, SSP1, even it's the same sort of burning embers color. So yellow is um, medium impacts, um, red is high and purple is the worst. So you can see just for example, in desertification, if we chose SSP1, even as the temperature increases on the left above 1.5 approaches to the impacts on communities will actually not be purple. They will not be as severe. And it's the same thing, less so in land degradation, but in food insecurity, it's the same thing. And so this report is really telling us that if we take a much more sustainable approach, um, if we ensure environmental, um, environmental justice and social justice, then the communities that are the most vulnerable to climate change may in fact feel fewer significant and severe impacts even as the temperature increases. And so we need to make sure that societies, particularly vulnerable societies are climate resilient societies. And climate resilient ones are the ones that are able to recover from shocks and anticipate future shocks. And the most resilient societies are the ones that are the wealth or have some kind of wealth, have some kind of equality and access to healthy natural and social resources. And that helps these societies build resilience. And so my point is that even though companies and company law have for a long time felt that they're not part of uh, climate action and building climate resilience, and company law itself has acted to, as a barrier to climate action, that really shouldn't be the case. Company law can actually, through reform initiatives, transform that kind of barrier to climate action to a bridge. And that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. That was a remarkable tour de force. Um, and I thought you, your slides were brilliantly coordinated with your very interesting lecture. Um, there's a lot of themes to explore there. Um, can I, I mean, we've had a number of questions. Can I just, one question which interests me particularly is, is about the relationship between the company responsibility and the head company responsibility and state liability. Because, I mean, as it happens, the Vedanta case, which you mentioned, was, I wasn't in the court then, but I was, I happened to be in Zambia um, at a Commonwealth Law Conference at the time when the my colleagues in the Supreme Court issued their decision saying that the um, Zambian claimants could sue the head company in, in this kind in the UK. Um, and there was a strong feeling among the lawyers who were at the conference, the Zambian lawyers, that this was somehow insulting to Zambia because Zambia ought to be able to look after its own problems. And I was very interested to, to hear that you were saying that in fact, that's maybe what's happened that the Zambian government has actually intervened. Um, and one of the questions someone has asked is, well, what is the relationship between the sort of corporate responsibility and that of the, of, of the national government? So it's a, it's a very interesting point. And I'm from a developing country, so I'm from the Caribbean. And so, you know, I, we have appeals to the Privy Council. I fully understand those arguments. And in fact, Justice Coulson in the decision, I think in the high court said, you know, some people may feel that this is colonial condescension, the way that I'm talking about the Zambian legal system. And it's quite an interesting uh, point and an interesting tension. There's a paper by a professor in Canada called Sarah Sack where she talks about home state um, responsibility for, for um, nation states who have a parent company. And in fact, this sort of feeling about, you know, we're gonna remove it to another jurisdiction sort of ignores the idea of sort of an impoverished sovereignty from decades of colonialism. So it's not that these legal systems just woke up and have issues today. You know, there's a lot of um, 
economic and political tension um, that has uh, really led to some of the problems we have in terms of access to justice. And so I take the point very seriously. Um, you know, governments, sovereign governments have responsibilities to ensure that they have environmental legislation, but there is a chronic um, issue of lack of enforcement of environmental regulations across the global south. And so there is a report by the UN Environment, which the uh, person who's asked the question might be interested in from 2019. And it talks about the environmental rule of law and it goes through specific countries, um, highlights them in the global south and some of the issues that they're really struggling with, with um, enforcing the environmental rule of law. So there's chronic um, issues with enforcement of judgments in um, a number of states in the developing world. And in fact, um, a number of environmental defenders are being killed. That's on the rise. Uh, the Environmental Justice Atlas has an indication of, I think, almost 2,000 incidences of environmental conflicts that are still ongoing around the world. And these often involve extractive industries. So yes, there is a responsibility on nation states, but we can't fix everything and we can't fix everything now. And we are hitting you know, time crunches in terms of climate change. So I really don't have an issue in terms of jurisdiction. Um, I take the point that you know, there are sensitivities around that, uh, but the ultimate test, and Professor Seck makes this point, the ultimate test of the home states of these parent companies is whether or not the voices of the claimants are heard and justice is provided. That's the ultimate endpoint that we all wanna to get to. Um, there's a question about whether the, whether the Chandler factors sort of may incentivize parent companies not to know too much. I mean, you cited you were, concentrate on those sort of companies which say we are all one family or one group and we are you know, BP saying we're all in it for zero uh, emissions. I mean, there's a danger that the actual criteria, in fact, incentivize com the parent companies to keep away from their subsidiaries. And how, how do you deal with that? I think um, that's an excellent point, and that's why legislative reform is so necessary. So um, Professor Chowdhury and Petron have a great book called Corporate Duties to the Public, and they critique the Chandler factors as being both over and under inclusive. They're over inclusive in that every company has group policies, right? What these, what these companies do in terms of their group policies is just chronic across com uh, companies and company law. And so, you know, making just the existence of a policy is gonna do exactly what you have talked about. It's gonna mean that companies either don't have group policies or they say in their group policies, we're not responsible for any of this. And then it's um, sort of under-inclusive in that it really depends on the control that a parent has exercised. And so if a particular corporate model means there's no control exercised by the parent company, then you, know, you can't have a claim, you can't have access, even though the parent company has benefited financially from the activities, often hazardous activities of the group. And so having this just um, flat enterprise liability tells companies that if you have a group, then you have to internalize these costs, you have to know about that in advance. And so it is clean, it is simple, um, and it doesn't have these sort of vagaries in terms of companies changing group policies or group operations to avoid the Chandler factors. Um, and so there's a different um, solution put forward for net network companies, but that's why I think enterprise liability through legislation is just a much cleaner fix. Um, I mean, there's a I, I wasn't quite clear actually whether you all suggest, I mean, the, the cases you, uh, you cited were, were English cases, apart from the RWE one, which is a slightly different point. Um, are you envisaging reform in the sort of domestic English context, or are you looking more broadly? I, I you know, there's been mention of a sort of international um, human rights law, which would be, I mean, how, 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 where do you see the, the reform coming from? So I think in this particular paper, I'm arguing for domestic reform in the United Kingdom through legislation. And that's because we've seen you know, clear movements in this direction because of the Chandler factors. I haven't really touched on human rights, but um, it implicates human rights and environmental harms do implicate human rights. There's a movement to um, update the um, United Nations guiding principles. So there's a working group, I think they just met last month, which is considering a new zero draft for liability for transnational companies um, in relation to violations of human rights. It's a very contentious issue. Um, a number of countries don't want to have that kind of liability established and a number of companies don't either. And so we'll see where that draft goes. I think they've been working on this for several years. So there's movements afoot. Um, and in terms of climate litigation, we haven't seen that kind of litigation in the UK yet in terms of companies, but it's happening all over the world. Um, 
It's actually happening in terms of financial institutions as well. They're being sued. A lot of the movements around um, corporate disclosure, climate risk disclosure started from the Bank of England in the UK. So I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if we see cases like that in the UK, but in terms of company reform itself, I'm really looking at um, legislative reform in the United Kingdom. Yeah. I mean, I think it's been suggested, I think there's a question from here's Chris Wilson. Why liability law for companies? What about laws on climate disclosure and on ESG investment more broadly? i.e. financial services law more than corporate law, might not it be better for companies to be changed that way and include any subsidiaries within that approach? Um, I mean, I think he, he's thinking there about having a rather broader approach. You're looking at a very narrow issue where we probably need a broad approach to general companies' responsibilities. What do you say to that? I agree, and they don't have to be mutually exclusive, so we can do both. <laughs> So uh, we can have liability regime for companies and in parallel, there's already movements afoot through the task force on financial related disclosures around making um, disclosures mandatory for companies and around climate risk. And so these are also happening in the context of the pandemic, for example. So Canada has extended COVID relief to companies um, in, um, and the condition of that is that they have to make sure that they disclose on climate risk when they, if they receive that kind of funding. So it is happening around the world. And in fact, Lord Carnworth was involved in the update of the enterprise principles, which establishes principles, legal principles of liability for companies. So these are you know, international principles. They have not um, sort of crystallized into international law. But I think that we are in the phase where we are seeing some countries establishing mandatory obligations for climate risk disclosure, and that is good. And I think the next step of, the, of that is actually having um, obligations for companies to actually reduce. So we're you know, in the process of getting to liability for climate change through actual legislation, but liability for risks and environmental risks um, can also happen through company law as well, while we wait for larger reform. Yes, I think so. I see um, if Ryan Lee's following up. Do you see a potentially softer solution if the law made it mandatory for co corporates to have a degree of knowledge over their supply chain, including benefits and liabilities from subsidiaries, and to write an annual report on these subsidiaries and justification for any liabilities? I mean, that's a sort of broader approach, and I think uh, may be rather easier to sort of sell as a, as a law reform project. Well, what do you think of that? So I think uh, it, it can happen. And in fact, France has this, uh, what they call the duty of, dil uh, duty of vigilance, sorry. It's not due diligence, but effectively it means that companies have an obligation to effectively do what Ryan has asked, to um, have due diligence in relation to their uh, supply chains, specifically in relation to human rights. And then I think if they can prove that they have um, exercise due diligence, then you know, they're not going to be liable for it. And I think Switzerland is considering something similar in relation to human rights, a referendum on having those kinds of obligations. So you know, for the most part, corporate social responsibility and even climate change, we're in this sort of reporting phase for companies. Like, tell us what you're doing, tell us what the risks are. And eventually, we're going to have to move into a liability phase, specifically if they don't do that. And so you know, we're sort of in this sort of staged process. And to be clear, although the issues are very urgent and time sensitive, we've come a long way in terms of thinking about company law in the context of climate change and even companies like Carbon Majors thinking about climate change. When I started thinking about this you know, six or seven years ago, people thought I was kind of crazy. Not my supervisors at University of Leicester who were lovely and encouraged it, but people thought, really? Companies in climate change? So lucky for me, <laughs> it's become a lot more popular, but we've come a long way in a short period of time. Yes. Well, I think we're coming, we've, got to, we've come a short, a long way in a, in a very short lecture. So and I think we've got to the stage where we're going to have to end now. Um, I mean, I think this is a fascinating debate. And I think trying to see how one develops these principles of corporate responsibility in a sort of environmentally conscious way um, is very interesting. I mean, the sort of liability is one part of it, but the, also the, the whole question of the attribution which you've touched on is extraordinarily interesting and, and so, so interesting to see how the civil law deals with that through the mm -hmm. German cases. So thank you so much for that. It's been a really excellent talk. I, I feel so sorry we can't now all go off and have a drink and sort of carry on the conversation <laughs> having a drink, but sadly not 
able to talk to you and it's probably a bit early for you to start drinking. Um, I definitely so see anyways. the renovations in the law faculty. <laughs> it's very different than when I was there. So I'm going to oh, take up your invitation. That's, that's <laughs> true. Anyway, thank you so much, Lisa. That's been absolutely marvelous.